The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. It's time to get back to learning. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, tomorrow, there'll be a 10-minute quiz in recitation based upon the content of uh, homework one. Obviously, it's not going to be a question identical to something you've done, but it's going to cover that subject matter. So please don't bring in your attorney if I didn't ask a question that's identical to one that you've worked. Um, second thing, uh, we started talking about the periodic table. And uh, I believe that it's a, a hallmark of any educated person in the 21st century who's technically literate to know the periodic table by heart. And so there will be another test. It will be on the 23rd, on the Thursday, 10 minutes. You will be asked to um, write down the periodic table. But you don't have to do the whole table. We're going to leave out the lanthanides and actinides. So this is what it's going to look like. You'll have uh, S block, P block, and D block elements identical to this. You can see this was September 18th. If I could just ask if the uh, people can fix the uh, video. It's just a little bit off, uh, set off to the left here. Um, so this is what you'll get. You get 10 minutes to fill it in. And uh, you know, people grouse about it. They say, oh, this is road learning. This went out at the end of the 19th century and so on. And I say, no. I think any, any of you should know that uh, potassium lies under sodium. I bet there are people in this room that know the lyrics to over a thousand songs, know the number of every individual in the uh, National Basketball Association. So I think that learning uh, some subset of elements is not unreasonable. Everybody's done it in the past. They grouse about it when I assign it, and they all do it within a minute. And then they're proud of it, and they insist that I infl and not inflict, but rather uh, induce you, invite you to do the same thing. Uh, but I don't want to leave out the lanthanides and actinides, so we're going to have contests for mnemonics. So lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, and so on. So here's an example of a mnemonic. Um, so there will be two of these uh, contests, one for lanthanides, one for actinides, uh, submitted by email by 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time to my office, to my email address. So this is an example. Lazy college professors never produce sufficiently educated graduates to dramatically help executives trim yearly losses. And this, if you remember this phrase, I don't know why you would, but this will help you learn the uh, lanthanides in order. You can see that this obviously came from industry. Uh, there's the reference to executives. There's the slur against the academy here, lazy college professors. I mean, they have no idea how hard we work. And look at this gigantic split infinitive to dramatically help. We can do better. So this is 3091 uh, winners from previous years. Um, this is one. <laughs> Clearly, this was not referring to the 309 professor. <laughs> you know, there's uh, other ways to take chemistry at MIT. In fact, there's a whole chemistry department full of loony chemistry professors. Um, oh, here's another one. This one, this one uh, piqued my interest. I thought this was, uh, you know, I like the engineering theory part of it. That's what I like. But now, this is the piece de resistance. I've been doing this for many years, and all of a sudden comes a sonnet. There are 14 F block elements, and an Elizabethan sonnet contains 14 lines. Well, OK, this looks good. And so there's the cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, you know, three stanzas, four lines apiece with the rhyming couplet at the end. But what's really shocking is when you compare this with this, it's a based upon Sonnet 57, because lanthanum is element 57. This is really, really good. And I mean, I wouldn't just give it to him because he, did, he wrote a sonnet, but there were some uh, key points here. You see, he mentioned smelting. And as an extractive metallurgist, that took the cake. When he said smelting, I said, OK, you got it. So um, I think this is something to, uh, to think about. Uh, we'll wait before we go to that one. Blank on that. OK, so uh, the contest, there's a, the prizes are uh, neckties and um, uh, lady scarves. With, uh, they're, they're very hot. They're black with uh, colored uh, elements of the periodic table. 
It's very nice. Don't laugh. I'll bring samples next day. They really look sharp. Very sharp. And you know, there's all kinds of gift giving coming down the road. You never know when one of these could just do the trick. Um, so don't fail to enter. Um, and uh, I will have office hours today uh, starting about 3.30. To 4:30, go to my. If you want to see me, by all means, go to your own recitation instructor, uh, as well. So last day we were looking at uh, some early uh, taxonomy, and then on to a little bit more about the interior of the atom. And we looked at the representation of elements on the periodic table, where we have the proton number z, which is equal to the number of electrons in the neutral atom, and the atomic mass, which is the sum of the proton number and the neutron number, and we talked about uh, isotopes and, and whatnot. Um, today, um, I want to continue. So far, we've been looking at static elements, but most people think of chemistry as involving reactions. So let's look at dynamics, reactions between chemicals. So how do we describe a chemical reaction? What are the rules? Well, the first thing you do is you write an equation, and the equation is subject to these constraints. First of all, we invoke Dalton's law. We invoke Dalton's law of molar proportions. Dalton's law of molar proportions. And secondly, we write it subject to conservation of mass. Conservation of mass. And I mean literally mass, not mole number. And let's look at this. This is probably best seen by example. So let's look at a simple one. This is the calcination of uh, limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate. And at about 900 degrees centigrade, uh, calcium carbonate decomposes to give lime or calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. And uh, this is used uh, as the first step for making a cement concrete. Um, and so when you think about how much cement and concrete are uh, consumed annually on the planet, this becomes a considerable source, point source, of greenhouse gas emissions. As you know, carbon dioxide is implicated as a greenhouse gas, and there's a huge amount of, uh, of uh, CO2 that comes from this uh, process. Uh, this is also used in steel making and so on. So anything on the left side of the equation is called a reactant. And anything on the right side of the equation is called a product. So the products react to give us reactants. And just to show some of the hidden uh, balance here, here we have one mole. I don't put a one in front. We just take one for granted. So there's one mole of calcium carbonate. That gives us one mole of calcium oxide and one mole of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so here we have two moles, and here we have one mole. So what's the conservation of mass? If we divide by the uh, atomic masses here, we will get 100.1 grams of calcium carbonate, and then discover that we have 56.1 grams of calcium oxide and 44 grams of carbon dioxide. So clearly, mass is conserved, not mole numbers. And if you have trouble balancing equations, you can look in section 2. 0.11 in the text, and they go through some uh, mechanics. Um, but now I want to look at what happens when th uh, things are not in proper proportion. So in other words, what happens if we put a bunch of uh, elements, compounds, into a reactor, but they're not in the balanced amounts? And so for that, um, I want to look at the production of titanium by the Kroll process. And this involves the reaction of titanium tetrachloride with magnesium to form magnesium chloride plus titanium. This was invented in 1937 by W.J. Kroll. While he was still in Luxembourg, he just before, just before World War II broke out, he immigrated to the United States and finished his career in the Pacific Northwest, where he helped uh, make huge quantities of, of titanium. And this is performed, this reaction is performed in a giant batch type reactor in which you feed titanium tetrachloride and magnesium and heat to about 900 degrees C. And as the reaction goes, we'll have some 
magnesium liquid sitting on top of magnesium chloride liquid, and then chunks of titanium solid forming at the bottom with titanium chloride gas above. And this is a really clever reaction because titanium tetrachloride is a gas, so it's obviously buoyant. Magnesium is a liquid, but it's less dense than magnesium chloride. So as these products form, they continue to fall out of the way and keep this interface open so the reaction can keep going. And at the end of the reaction, you have the uh, reactor uh, consumed of titanium tetrachloride magnesium. You have salt on top, and you have titanium on the bottom. And this is what the stuff looks like. This is a, uh, earlier this summer, I was at a um, smelter in Japan, the largest uh, titanium smelter on the planet. And this is coming out of one of these reactors. This is about three meters across and about six meters tall. This is titanium sponge that comes out of the bottom of this reactor. And it's subsequently remelted in a vacuum arc furnace. And these are giant billets of solid titanium weighing tens of tons. OK, so let's say some young engineer is on the job the first day and says, OK, let's put in 200 kilograms of tickle. And let's put in about 25 kilograms of mag. I'm using the typical terms. Nobody says titanium tetrachloride. It's tickle. This is mag. I had a graduate student. Um, she was a brilliant PhD student of mine. And she had two dogs. This is parenthetical. And she, and, uh, she loved metallurgy, as I do. And she named one of her dogs Maggie and one of her dogs Molly, magnesium and molybdenum. Boy, you, you have no sense of humor whatsoever. <laughs> Either that or you're dog lovers and you're offended by giving them metallic names. I don't know. All right, so what happens? What does this engineer give us? What is the yield? What is the yield? Okay, so what we have to do is get back underneath this reaction and see what the molar quantities are. So titanium tetrachloride, magnesium. I've got 200 kilograms here, 25 kilograms here. And if I divide by the appropriate uh, uh, quantities, I'll discover I have a little over 1,000 moles of tickle. And I've got about 1,000 moles of, of mag. But the reaction says I need twice as much mag as tickle if this reaction is going to go to completion. And clearly, this isn't twice that. In fact, it's even less that. So we've got a problem here. This is much less than 2 times 1054. So therefore, mag is the limiting reagent. Mag is the limiting reagent. And that's going to gate the yield. It's going to control the yield. The yield is going to be throttled by magnesium. So how much, how much uh, titanium can I make? I can only make as much titanium as is consumed by the available magnesium. So if I look at the mole ratios on the reaction over there, I'm going to find that I'll be able to consume at most 1029 over 2. Right? Two moles of mag consume one mole of tickle, giving us one mole of tie. And that's 515 moles of uh, tickle consumed, and then that produces 515 moles titanium, and then I convert that to mass, and that gives me 24.7 kilograms of titanium. If I charge the reactor in this manner, and of course I'm assuming 100% completion of the reaction, which we know is um, overly optimistic, there may be some um, inefficiencies. And at some point, if you catch me in the hallway, I can give you a sermonette on what goes on inside that reactor. Okay, so now the question is, how do we know in the first place that this is a suitable reductant? How do we know that mag will reduce titanium tetrachloride? Well, for this, we have to look inside the atom. And as I'm going to do many times in 3091, we're going to start a unit like this with a history lesson. So let's go back to the thrilling days of the end of the 19th century and just take stock. What did we know at the end of the 19th century about the structure of the atom? Well, first of all, we knew that the atom was electrically neutral. We knew that the negative charge is carried by some particles called electrons. Uh, that furthermore, that the electron has a very tiny mass in comparison to that of the overall atom. I mean, the atom has a tiny mass, too. But what we're saying is, compared to the total atomic mass, the mass of the electron is tiny. Um, and secondly, the bulk of the atom is positive. If the atom is fixed mass, the electron's tiny, not massive, then duh, it must be the positives have all the mass. And uh, 
That's what we knew. So the question then is, what's the spatial distribution of charge inside the atom? Why do we want to know the answer to that question? Because that's going to give clues as to reactivity. So what do we know about spatial distribution? Well, people took a stab at modeling it, and the first model worth talking about is that of J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson, who published this model in 1904. He was a professor of physics at Cambridge University, and he was uh, also the director of the Cavendish Laboratory. I guess they would say laboratory. So he was the director of the laboratory. And uh, Cavendish made a fortune in the 1700s and willed it to Cambridge, and so they established this uh, laboratory in his name. And here's the essence of what uh, J.J. said. He said that the electrons were distributed throughout a uniformly charged positive sphere of atomic dimensions. So electrons, electrons uh, distributed throughout, electrons distributed throughout a uniformly charged, uniformly charged positive sphere. uniformly charged positive sphere, and I'll, let me finish it, of atomic dimensions. So essentially you've got a positive ball which is identical to the size of the atom. This was termed the plum pudding model. Plum pudding. This is cultural bias, of course. This is a British term. I've never eaten this stuff. I don't know if I'd eat it if it were put in front of me, but Anyways, the, uh, I'm told that it looks something like this, uh, that you have the custard with little fragments of plum inside. So this is a positive sphere, positive sphere of custard, and inside are little negative bits. This is the plum. And these bits are in motion. So the bulk of the atom is positive. That's where the mass resides, and you've got these tiny little negatives running around. So the negatives are, these are negative, they're physically small, they're uh, very light, that is to say low mass, they're mobile, they're moving around, and oh, the, w the worst thing is that J.J. in 1897 did the pioneering work that got him the Nobel Prize. He measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron, but he didn't, he didn't use the term electron. He called this negative elemental particle the corpuscle. He called it the corpuscle of electric charge. And he kept referring to them as corpuscles. And I'm really glad that along came uh, John Stone Stoney, who was an electrochemist, right, the noblest form of chemistry. And as an electrochemist, he chose the term for the element of electric charge, the electron, coming from the Greek word for amber. Because you know if you rub amber, you get static charge. So thank goodness Stony triumphed, otherwise we'd be talking about corpuscular mail. You'd have C mail, you wouldn't have E mail. All right, so anyways. So, all right, so we have a theory. It's 1904. What's the method of science? You have a theory, what do you do? Put it to the test. So who puts it to the test? Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford, uh, he was a professor of physics at well, as well but he was at Victoria University in Manchester. Victoria University in Manchester, just up the road from Cambridge. Both of these were in the UK in the early part of the 20th century. And he conducted experiments to test the plum pudding model. And basically what he did is he took a very thin metal foil and he bombarded it with charged particles. And uh, here's the Rutherford experiment. It's taken right out of your text, but before I... Uh, um, go into details, a little bit more background about Rutherford. Rutherford was an interesting person. He was born in New Zealand, and he came from a farming family. He was the first generation to go to college, uh, grew up in the farms, and, and as such, he was very skilled with machining. He was very handy. He was a brilliant experimentalist. That's not to say he wasn't a brilliant thinker, but he had the gift of good mind and good hands, like the two parts of the MIT logo. Two parts rolled into one. He did his PhD. He managed to get a, a fellowship, and he came to the UK, all the way from New Zealand. 
He got his Ph.D. under J.J. Thompson at Cambridge. And there he studied uh, radiation coming from radioactive elements. And he categorized two different types of radiation, which he termed alpha and beta. And what he found was that the alpha radiation, alpha radiation as he studied it, was very, very good at ionizing gases, whereas beta radiation was not so good at ionizing gases. On the other hand, when it came to penetrating solids, penetrating solids, uh, the alpha radiation was poor at penetrating solids, whereas the uh, beta radiation was very good at penetrating solids. So you see, this is formative information. He, he understood the interaction of particles with matter, and that's important to set the stage for the Rutherford experiment in uh, Manchester about 10 years later. Um, he took a job teaching, uh, went to another part of the British Empire, went to Canada, got a job at McGill. And he worked for uh, a little less than 10 years at McGill, where he did more work on these uh, particles that radiate from uh, radioactive elements. And there he was able to identify the alpha particle as the helium nucleus. It's helium denuded of both of its electrons. So all that's left is the helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. And for this, he got the Nobel Prize, 1908. 1908 Nobel in physics. Uh, let me just check that. Yes. No, excuse me. He got it in chemistry. Got it. And why I'm hesitating is in the early days of the 20th century, the Nobels were first given in 1901. But we'll see as 3091 progressives, People working almost on the same topic, making new discoveries out of the same lab, one of them might subsequently win the Nobel in physics, one might win it in chemistry, because the, the disciplines weren't as diverse as they are today. So that's why I hesitate. So he got the Nobel in chemistry, which made him a hot property academically, and so he got hired to come to the UK and got the job at Victoria University after uh, bagging the Nobel in... Uh, chemistry. Uh, by the way, his, uh, he didn't outdo his advisor, J.J. J.J. already got his Nobel in 1906 for that work on the charge to mass ratio. So let's give him his credit. Uh, Nobel in physics. I rather suspect if J.J. hadn't got his Nobel, it probably would have been tough for Rutherford to get one since some of these guys sit on the committees. But it's just a speculation. All right. So now let's get on and talk about the experiment. So what we've got here is a source of alpha particles. Alpha particles are these helium nuclei, and they are the result of radioactive decay. So you've got polonium or thorium sitting inside this uh, leaded box with one opening. And so we've got a beam, and these particles are of extremely high energy, very, very high energy. And they strike a thin foil of metal. And Rutherford tried various metals, uh, but the, the famous experiment is attributed to the use of gold. We've known since antiquity that you could take gold and you could hammer it to very, very thin foil. And in this case, they had foil that was less than a micrometer thick. This was a, uh, 600 nanometers thick, very, very thin. And so the experiment was to bombard the foil with these alpha particles and then measure what happens to them. So we have to be able to detect them. And so Rutherford had a, a fellow working in his lab by the name of Geiger. And Geiger invented a detector. It's called the scintillation screen. He ultimately invented the Geiger counter that bears his name. But he, he built a scintillation screen, which is essentially a cloth fiber that was covered with zinc sulfide. And when zinc sulfide is hit by particles or by anything, by radiation or by particles of greater than a certain critical energy, there's a glow. That's the, from the Latin word scintilla, okay, spark. So you sit, you get graduate students or some other form of cheap labor, and you have them sit in front of the scintillation screen, and they count. They count where these particles hit the screen. And then what they did is they made a map of where the particles scattered once they struck the screen. And here's what their findings were. The, finding, the important findings of note are the following. First of all, the majority of the alpha particles were transmitted through the screen. Okay? 
majority, vast majority, majority of alphas transmitted. Transmitted. That means, when I use the term transmitted, that means passing through in the direction uh, that they were originally traveling. Transmitted and some deflected through small angles. Deflected through small angles. I'm going to ab abbreviate, just put theta. theta. I mean, what else do you use theta for if not angles? So deflected through small angles. All right? That's the main thing that they observe. But there's a second thing. And this was really, really shocking. A tiny fraction of the incident alpha particles were deflected through large angles. By large angles, I mean greater than 90 degrees, essentially coming back in the direction from which they came. Okay, So tiny fraction, tiny fraction of alphas, tiny fraction of incident alphas, tiny fraction of incident alphas uh, deflected through large angles. And that, I mean, greater than 90 degrees. So this is called backscattering. And in fact, there's a technique of analysis uh, used today that's called Rutherford backscattering, where people actually saw that this is a, a means of identifying the, the, the substance, the sample. The scattering is an indication of the nature of the substance. And this was a surprise, because when you take a look at what that gold foil constitutes in the way of a resistance to a beam of charged particles of 7.68 million electron volts when Rutherford, when Rutherford learned of these results, he said, this is akin to having a 15-inch artillery shell deflect back from a piece of tissue paper to give you a sense of the relative scales. If you took a 15-inch artillery shell moving at the velocity it typically goes at, and take that amount of kinetic energy versus the resistive capacity of a sheet of tissue paper, that's the scale that we're looking at here. It was absolutely astonishing. So they thought about this. And they said, you know, this cannot make sense from the standpoint of the plum pudding model. You know, this can't make sense. Because the plum pudding model says you've got uniformly distributed charge. So if I've got positive charge, uniformly distributed. And look at the choice. It's a brilliant experiment. He didn't shoot neutrals. He shot alpha particles, which have a charge of plus 2. So I've got plus 2s zooming in at high energy against a wall of positive charge. And most of the stuff goes flying through. So you just say, well, this is like a bullet going through a pumpkin. So what's the big deal? But how do you explain some of these going way, way back? And that's when Rutherford says, this can't be right. I'm going to come up with something else. I'm going to come up with this model. I'm going to say that the positive charge is not uniformly distributed. I'm going to say, quite to the contrary, the positive charge is concentrated at the center in a tiny, tiny, tiny volume. So I've got this tiny volume with, in case of gold, 79 plus of charge. And then I've got some electrons out here somewhere. And the vast majority of the atom is nothing. Isn't this a lot like Democritus? Being and void. Being and void. So now I've got my plus two little projectile coming in. And plus two zooms right through. But there's a positive 79, so the positives deflect. And so there's a little bit of deflection, because plus repels plus. But once in a while, one of these plus twos comes in almost on axis, and it gets whipped around by the Coulombic repulsive forces. So that's Rutherford's explanation of this set of data. Oh, by the way, there's a third person. There's Rutherford, there's Geiger, there's Marsden. Marsden's an interesting uh, character. Marsden was not too different from you. Marsden was essentially a Europe. He'd, he'd left school for a couple of years. He, was, he, was, he hadn't got his undergraduate degree yet. He'd come back, and Rutherford accepted him in his lab. I think the man was something like 20 years of age. So he said to Marsden, he said, you know what? Take these data. I'm going to give you the data set of, of the scattering angles of the, uh, 
atoms. And he, uh, he says, um, give me a model for this. That's the assignment. Get busy. So uh, Marsden came up with a model. And uh, as you go through 802 and you understand electrostatics and electrodynamics, you'd be able to do this analysis. B is the assumed cross-section of the nucleus. And then on either side is nothing. So you've got a huge distance between center to center. And so all Marsden is doing is asking, what must be the, if I've got a wall of nothing with spots of high positive charge, and this is my scattering data, what must be the relative size of the spots versus the nothing? And he solved the problem. And he concluded, let's get his name on the board. Heck, he deserves to have his name on the board. Marsden. So Marsden concluded by his analysis that the radius of the nucleus, and this is uh, Rutherford, by the way, coining this term. It's a nuclear model. It's a nuclear model. The radius of the nucleus, as compared to the radius of the entire atom, is on the order of about 1 to 10,000. 1 to 10,000. So indeed, we are talking about a lot of void and a tiny little bit of extremely dense being. So they publish this, and what's the result? You'd think, wow, they finally solved it. It's terrific. Hooray. No. It's science. They tear each other's eyes out. The reaction to the uh, model was strongly negative. Derision was the typical reaction. They said, look, this is stupid. First of all, this thing can't sustain itself. You've got a positive charge here with negative charge around it. Coulomb's law says the negative will be attracted to the positive, and the atom will collapse. So that's their first objection, um, nuclear collapse. Every, all the electrons fall into the nucleus. You know, the data suggests that's what it is. The problem is that the theory of the day can't explain it. So, of course, theoreticians bristle. You know, it was Huxley that said, you know, woe to the slaying of a beautiful theory by an ugly fact. Yeah. Nuclear collapse. So the Coulombic forces, Coulombic or electrostatic forces, uh, draw. I don't need to write it. You know what it means. The Coulombic forces. End of story. All right. Number two. Second one. So even if it didn't collapse, they said you got a radiation problem. You've got negative charge in motion, and it's in a circular orbit. And you know acceleration means either change of speed or change of direction. You'll learn in 802 that if you have a charged body changing direction, that constitutes an acceleration, and it will be accompanied by radiation. Radiation is the emission of energy. And so again, this thing's going to run out of gas. All right? So an energy deficit. Energy deficit. Uh, accelerating charge, the accelerating negative charge, because it's the negatives that are orbiting the uh, positive center. And that means radiation, radiation of energy. And that energy has to come from inside the atom itself. So on both counts, they say this is, uh, this is no good. It's no good. Well, time marches on, 1912. 1912, interesting. A young Danish scientist by the name of Niels Bohr. He just finished his PhD in Copenhagen, and he won himself a postdoctoral fellowship courtesy of the Carlsberg Brewery Foundation. Carlsberg Brewery, for many years, has sponsored scientific research through the Carlsberg Foundation. And so Niels had a PhD and a Carlsberg Foundation fellowship, and he decided, well, I'm interested in modern physics. There's some conflict in the air. One of the proponents is J.J. Thompson. One of the proponents is Ernest Rutherford. I know what I'll do. I'll spend six months with J.J. in Cambridge, and I'll spend six months with Rutherford in Manchester. And that's what he set out to do. So he goes to um, Cambridge, and he spends six months with Thompson. And then he heads up, the, up north, and then he spends only three months in Manchester, not because he didn't like Rutherford. Actually, it was quite the contrary. He far preferred Rutherford to Thompson. But 
he got a teaching job, and so he zoomed back to Denmark to assume his teaching duties. And during the time of his interactions with uh, Thompson and Rutherford, he got to thinking about a way to explain the observations of Rutherford. And so he finished the manuscript back in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, he completes the manuscript. And I'm going to write MS for manuscript. Completes the manuscript and submits this for publication. It's a, it's a paper that describes the, uh, a model to explain the results. So you see how we're oscillating back and forth? J.J. Thompson, model. Rutherford, experimental data. Now Bohr comes with new improved model. So obviously what's going to have to happen next is some more data to test Bohr's model. So first of all, let's take a look at how we conduct science. I said Bohr came up with a model. How do we find out about it? Did we read about it in the New York Times? Did we see it on the nightly news? No, people publish. And this is the publication of Bohr's model. It's in a journal, a scientific journal. It goes back to the 1600s. It's called Philosophical Magazine and Journal of Science. People just know it as Phil Mag. It's 1913. It's London, Edinburgh, and Dublin. You see, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom at that time. So Dublin was a British city at the time this was published. All right, July 1913. I'm going to blow this up. So on the Constitution of Atoms and Molecules by N. Bohr, Doctor of Philosophy, Copenhagen, asterisk here, and I've blown up the bottom of the page, communicated by Professor Ernest Rutherford, FRS, Fellow of the Royal Society. So only a member of the Royal Society could read the paper into the proceedings, into the session of the Society for subsequent publication. And this was July 1913. So we're going to read. We're going to read this together. I want you to see how science is conducted. So, introduction. In order to explain the results of experiments on scattering of alpha rays by matter, Professor Rutherford, and there's a footnote to the Rutherford model. So if you go and read Phil Mag, 669-1911, you'll see Rutherford's model as it's presented. Professor Rutherford has given a theory on, of the structure of atoms. According to this theory, the atoms consist of a positively charged nucleus surrounded by a stream of electrons kept together by attractive forces from the nucleus. The total negative charge of the electrons is equal to the positive charge of the nucleus. Further, the nucleus is assumed to be the seat of the essential part of the mass of the atom and to have linear dimensions exceedingly small compared with the linear dimensions of the whole atom. This is beautiful writing. It's crystal clear was written by someone almost 100 years ago whose native language isn't English. You can read this and you can learn because it's well written. I invite you to read. You know, if you go to the library, they have books. They have all of this. The number of electrons in an atom is deduced to be approximately equal to half the atomic weight. Great interest is to be attributed to this atom model. That's scientific talk. When someone says great interest, that's a, that's a euphemism for embroiled in controversy. You know, they don't say that nobody believes this. They say great interest. For, as Rutherford has shown, the assumption of the existence of nuclei as those in question seems to be necessary in order to account for the results of the experiments on large angle scattering of the alpha rays. In an attempt to explain some of the properties of matter on the basis of this atom model, we meet, however, with difficulties of a serious nature arising from the apparent instability of the system of electrons. Difficulties purposely avoided in atom models previously considered, for instance, in the one proposed by Sir J.J. Thompson. That's almost a slur. It's almost saying, there are difficulties, and you didn't treat them either. You just kind of swept them under the rug. But now you're out there in full force with your knives sharpened. You know, if you're so smart, why didn't you explain it? All right. So they go on and on and on and talking about stability. But here's the brilliance. Here's where it comes. The result of the discussion of these questions seems to be a general acknowledgment of the inadequacy of classical electrodynamics in describing the behavior of systems of atomic size. So he basically says, you know what? I can't explain this because classical physics doesn't work at atomic dimensions. He says, I plead guilty, but your physics is useless at this length scale. So we're even. Now let's start all over. 
size-dependent behavior. That's what nanotechnology is about, isn't it? If everything is the same. You know, when you were a kid, someone would say, which has a higher boiling point, a quart of water or a gallon of water? And the answer is, well, water boils at 100 degrees C, ha, ha, ha. Well, guess what? If I get you down to a cluster of about 30 water molecules, the boiling point is a function of the size of the water droplet. Now, that's new. That's new. But normally, no. So Bohr came way ahead of the game. Now, let's take a look at uh, the Bohr model of the atom. Let's see what's in there. Here it is. Uh, these are the Bohr postulates. And this stuff will be posted at the, uh, at the website, so you don't have to copy it all down. It's just taken out of the, the reading of lecture notes. Uh. So it's a planetary model. And it involves a single electron orbiting a positively charged nucleus. Okay, this is the Bohr model. Bohr model of the atom. It's planetary or nuclear. Okay, and it's got one electron only. One electron only. You've got to learn to crawl before you learn to run. Okay. But it could be not just atomic hydrogen. First of all, I want to point that this is not to scale. Marsden told us that this distance here is about 10,000. So if we've got a little speck here and an even tinier speck here, so this is not to scale. So this distance here is r. This is the radius of the orbit in which the electron um, travels. And so we have the positive charge in the center. And I'm going to just for convenience call that q1. And that's equal to the product of the proton number times E. In other words, this could be any one electron system. You say, well, wait a minute, what's he talking about? OK, atomic hydrogen, one proton, one electron. But I give you another one electron system. We learned about ions last day. If helium loses an electron, what do we have? We have a helium nucleus and one electron. So helium plus is a one electron system. What about lithium two plus? That's a one electron system. Well, my favorite is un, un, unium, 110 plus. <laughs> That's a one electron system. Okay? So all I do is I take into account that I've got all the positive charge. Whatever it is, it's in the nucleus. And the negative charge is always, Q2 is always equal to minus E, because it's a one electron system. You know, who's buried in Grant's tomb? How many electrons in a one electron system? Right? So there it is. Um, so this has got protons and neutrons, but the neutrons it doesn't matter about the neutrons. And don't ask me about what about the relative dimension of this. At 10,001, who cares? It doesn't matter how big it is. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the uh, derivation of that next day. But I think at this point it's probably uh, a good place to stop. And I, I, will, I will go through the, the actual line-by-line -line derivation, not because I want to do derivations in class. I'll only do them on one condition. And that is I want to be able to teach you what the assumptions are that underlie the points in the derivation. But I'm never going to ask you to derive things. But I'd ask you that, you know, since the class doesn't end until 11.55, there's no need to be gathering things up and snapping binders and so on. I know you just, you're, you're, you want to get on with life and, you know, you, you're on to the next thing and you're tuning out. But you see all the click, 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 click? There's actually one or two people down here that are feigning interest. You know, I kind of like to let them hear. So, uh, Let's be good neighbors. So anyways, uh, Bohr uh, ascended to the heights uh, achieved only by Einstein. Bohr and Einstein were considered the top two physicists in the world through the first part of the 20th century. If you go to Denmark and you, you break a $100 bill, you're going to be given one of these, undoubtedly, the 500 kroner note, which is worth about, I don't know, $75, $80, and it has Niels Bohr on it. And if you look carefully, it, it, it tries to... Uh, give the uh, sense of a, of a one electron system and things going on. Here's the young Niels Bohr. Uh, here's Bohr with uh, Heisenberg. We'll talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg postdoc with Bohr. These people all move from one capital to another. This one here, that's Einstein. This is the two giants of uh, modern physics Einstein and Bohr. Check out the hats. There's, uh, <laughs> there's a Homburg and there's a Borsellino. Really cool. Um, here's Bohr mixing it up with royalty. There's a young Queen Elizabeth. Uh, there's Prince Philip. 
And this is some Danish royalty in the back. Uh, never got invited to their place, so I don't know them. Bore like music. Uh, he and Louis Armstrong are discussing quantization of the... Uh, Um, in the year 2000, uh, the play by Michael Frayn, Copenhagen, is uh, set in Copenhagen in Nazi-occupied Germany, where uh, Niels Bohr is uh, in discussion with his former postdoc and student, Werner Heisenberg. And you can see the stage set here. There's Bohr at the center, and there's Heisenberg, who's the one electron orbiting the center, and then there's uh, Bohr's wife, who is the observer. You know, Heisenberg gave us the uncertainty principle, which we'll visit later. And so it's a very interesting play about, uh, you know, the morality of developing nuclear weapons and uh, uh, what, what does modern physics really uh, have to give us. A um, couple of other things about hydrogen. Hydrogen ha also, ha like other elements, has isotopes. So we already saw that in uh, 1766, Cavendish isolated atomic hydrogen and uh, enunciated some of its properties. He was in London, and uh, as I mentioned, he... He uh, deeded his fortune to the Cambridge University, and the Cavendish Lab is, is there to this day. Uh, in the 1931, at Columbia University, Harold Urey uh, discovered the, um, this isotope, which has uh, two, has an uh, atomic mass of, uh, of two, deuterium. And then, in 1934, it was Ernest Rutherford. At by, not by the mid-30s, J.J. Uh, Thompson had retired, and Rutherford was invited to occupy the, uh, the chair at uh, the Cavend and be the director of the Cavendish Laboratory. So he ended his uh, career in Cambridge. It, it, it is said of Rutherford, it is said of Rutherford that he is uh, unique among Nobel Prize winners that when you look at what he did here with the uh, experiment of the gold foil and how it was able to engender the insights of Bohr that, yeah, he got the Nobel Prize in 1908 for the uh, decomposition or disintegration of matter, but people generally say Rutherford did his best work after he got the Nobel Prize. And here he is in 1934 with the discovery of tritium. Uh, last comments, hydrogen. Now here I'm, I'm using a little bit of license here. We've been talking about atomic hydrogen, H. Later on, we'll learn that hydrogen, as we typically encounter it, is H2, the molecule. And you've, uh, you've undoubtedly heard a lot in the, uh, in the public press and even in the political dialogue, such as it is these days, that uh, hydrogen might be uh, an environmentally friendly fuel. And even Cavendish, one of the things that he observed was that hydrogen could be combusted to produce water vapor. So you might say, well, gee, why don't we just uh, power our cars with hydrogen and use an internal combustion chamber? But in an internal combustion engine, what happens is we don't have an oxygen tank. We, in fact, borrow oxygen, or we, we, we steal oxygen from the air, free of charge. But as you know, air is only 20% oxygen, the balance being nitrogen. And so that nitrogen goes through the combustion chamber. And although you think that, well, nitrogen, I mean, it's, it's an inert gas. Well, if you get the combustion chamber hot enough, in point of fact, there are some reactions between nitrogen and the oxygen. And so you make not only water vapor, but you make some nitrous oxides, NOx or NOx, as it is known. And this is the precursor to smog. So if you want to attack urban air quality, uh, this is probably moving in the wrong direction. Okay? So people are uh, talking about the use of hydrogen in fuel cells. And we'll talk about fuel cells later in the semester when we do the unit on redox reactions in electrochemistry. But it's, uh, there are some issues here. Uh, putting hydrogen, hydrogen on board an automobile, it's one thing to have hydrogen in a tank, but this, uh, put it on a vehicle and keep that vehicle crashworthy. If the vehicle, in the unfortunate circumstances of a collision, um, has to be able to maintain the security of the hydrogen, which means more mass, which means a lot of the efficiency is being squandered. What's the environmental impact of hydrogen production? You get hydrogen on the hydrogen tree, where do you get it? Huh? Right. Electrolysis of water, catalytic decomposition of hydrocarbons. Well, electrolysis of water consumes energy. Where does the energy come from? It's electrical energy. You burn coal to make a little right. Catalytic decomposition of methane. You get the hydrogen, where does the carbon go? It goes up the stack of CO2. So one of the things that you can do 
is to become technically literate so that you can be part of the discussion and help formulate sensible policy. Put something on the road that, uh, uh, metaphorically, that we can all follow. And last is cost. Last is cost. Hydrogen is not cheap. So with that, I think I'll leave it until Wednesday. See you.